Good morning, everyone, and so grateful that we can be together. Obviously, as we look back over two weeks of horror and heartbreak, as we get to see for many of us in the New York area and really around the world, many of the structures and supports that gave us stability come away as we watch our family and our friends in grief, as we look at the options in front of the state of Israel that seem to only be terrible options, as we look at the continued loss of life of civilians and innocents, we are looking at a time where so much has come undone and so much fear rises to the surface. And it's really with this as a backdrop that I wanted to bring forward as an introduction um, a text actually that I shared over the high holidays. So in Song of Songs Rabbah, there's a, a beautiful text that in some ways is trying to explain the rabbinic response to a time of destabilization, destruction. And it notes that in the town of Usha, they invited all of the rabbis from different schools of thoughts to come. And they said, those who are already learned, they should come and learn. And those who are not yet learned, they should come and learn. And in having everyone come together, they found that all of their needs were met. And it may feel like at a time where there is so much pain, so much suffering, so much struggle, that the idea of coming together and learning may not be the courageous step in response. But I would argue at a time when we are finding the immediate knee-jerk reactions, the emotional responses without learning and reflective thought coming from every side, this great practice of our tradition in some ways is both the way that we expand our hearts, it is both the way that we anchor the feelings in a larger conversation, and it's the way in which we see in solidarity and growth and wisdom that perhaps we can find and chart a better path. And it's really with this as a backdrop that I have the honor of introducing Rabbanit Nechama Golden Barish. Many of you have already had the chance to learn from her, and we are so grateful to you already having been a teacher for us at Rota Shalom and as the director of the Pardes Learning Seminar. Um, and I won't go through her entire CV, but you should go and take a look um, really just about every kind of accolade one could have in the realm of Jewish learning and knowledge. Um, and with great gratitude really to Elaine and to Ari for helping to spark this partnership with Pardes, this is really a perfect moment to get to have particularly your leadership and your wisdom, Nakama, and grateful that we all can be joined together at a time when hopefully we can find some uplift, some hope, some wisdom in the learning that we get to do with you this morning. Thank you. Wow, thank you, uh, Rabbi Ben. Um, so I'm gonna start us off. I really, there, there are two things I wanna reflect upon as we go into our learning together. And the first is a psalm that we, hold on, let me see if I can get rid of this. Uh, a psalm that we stopped saying um, the day before the war break broke out. And I found it almost eerie, almost a little too um, coincidental that we stopped saying a psalm, which is all about protection from those who seek to destroy us from war, from enemies, from evil people. And the next day the war broke out. I never look for explanations or reasons. I'm observing. And I, I would like to open up with saying this psalm, which has become a psalm that has comforted me uh, over the last two weeks. And the second observation I want to make um, comes from an article in the Times of Israel today, an article about tremendous volunteering in a particular population. So I'm actually going to stop sharing for a moment as I can share this. If you had said to me the day before Simchat Torah that people from the protest camp were going to align in any way in cooperative initiatives with people from the ultra-Orthodox, right-wing, settler, extremist, whatever words you want to fill in, pro-reform camp, I would have said you're out of your mind. The nine or 10 months before the war broke out, were a time of extreme splintering, extreme disunity. Elaine, who has sat in my class last year at Matan, a class I've been giving on Talmudic personalities, and we started with the Second Temple period and moved onwards. We saw what was happening at the end of the Second Temple with corruption, with power struggles, with, with um, external enemies, but more significantly internal fighting, civil war, and so on. 
And every so often I would just stop in the middle of the text and, and I would reflect on how relevant these texts were for us today, right? 2000 years ago, seeing certain dynamics, interactions, um, the kind of fighting that comes out, the kind of e egoism and power and, and, and bids for power and corruption. And it was actually quite astonishing to feel that time had almost, a continuum had opened up and we had just fallen into a piece of history that we thought we had moved beyond. And so I say this because I was part of the protest movement on a small scale in Efrat, right? A group of religious settlers coming together to protest what we felt was uh, co corrupt uh, corruption to the judicial process to reform. And around me in my community, especially people who were anti what I was protesting, right? Like, so there was a lot of, of yelling and fighting and intolerance. And I opened up um, the, the Times of Israel today. I actually printed the article and brought it to my social justice class of 18 year old Orthodox girl stu female students. And, um, and I said, I want you to see this article because this is an article. And again, I'm not going to the reasons this war happened and is there any good that can come out of it? I, I, I don't do, I don't engage in that kind of theology. What I can observe is that in the aftermath of the war, the, the breaking down of walls and boundaries and barriers that had been erected from from Shamayim to Aretz, Aretz to Shamayim, from the ground all the way up, like there was no penetrating these barriers. Suddenly that all collapsed and the country has solidified in a kind of solidarity. So in this article, it talks about a convention center in Tel Aviv that because of the protest network that, they, the, that, that the protest movement had set up, they seamlessly moved into a network of both um, you know, going down south and fighting terrorists, providing aid, clothing for ultra-Orthodox people, food, right? Non-kosher restaurants. Again, I'll, I'll just remind you, Yom Kippur in Tel Aviv. I cried at the end of Yom Kippur to see what was happening in my country, right? Regardless of how you viewed it, but the debacle of Jew fighting Jew on Yom Kippur at a prayer service, not going into right or wrong, it was just the, 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 the sight of it was so painful, so terrible, regardless of what my personal feelings, who was right, who was wrong. And what you have in Tel Aviv today are trade restaurants that are proudly trade. They serve whatever they serve and they should be able to continue doing so. Koshering their kitchens so that every soldier who gets one of their meals can eat. I, I feel like my head is gonna explode because two and a half weeks ago, there is no way a non-kosher restaurant would have been interested at all in making their food available to a kosher clientele under any circumstance. And yet war broke out and people allowed spaces to open up around them in which these differences just didn't matter. And I can't help but hold that as we go into this, the, the horror and the terror and, and, and the difficult moral decisions that the army and the country have to make. And alongside that, the, the outpouring of, um, of solidarity going far beyond anything that the, the, the government or the politicians are able to provide, which gives me some hope that maybe when this is over, we can build something better and stronger and more unified than anything that the government, the politicians, or the country has been able to build. And so I'm going to go into the David Hashem Ori, right, into the psalm I'd like to start with, that I'd like to dedicate to the return of the hostages, to the end of the fighting, to the healing of those who have been wounded. I'd like to start with that, but I'd also like to hold the reality of what this is looking like in this country. And I could never have thought in a million years that the militant protest movement would be making kosher food for uh, religious soldiers and gathering clothing for ultra-Orthodox women, tights and, and long skirts and so on in clearly marked boxes. And, and, and ultra-Orthodox men who are volunteering for the army, 2000 showed up to volunteer for the army. No one could have expected that kind of 
breaking down of the barriers behind which we had all barricaded ourselves for nine months. So I'm starting with that article. It's also in the Times of Israel. There's some very good reporting about social um, the, the social pieces that are moving very radically in this country in the aftermath. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, I'm going to open my uh, screen. Ladavid Adonai Ori Bishi Mimi Ira. I'm going to read and translate each line. Oh, David, the Lord is my light and help. Whom should I fear? When evil men assail me to devour my flesh, it is they, my foes and enemies, who stumble and fall. Again, here is a psalm that is all about God being a stronghold as evil men assail me, devouring foes, enemies, really, uh, it sounds very different now than it did when I was saying it from Elul until uh, the eve of Simchat Torah. Shifti bevet Adonai kol yemei chayai lachzot benoam Adonai olavaker behechalo. Should an army besiege me, my heart would have no fear. Should war beset me, still would I be confident. To one thing I ask of the Lord, only that do I seek, to live in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to frequent his temple. And I'm going to continue, actually, because I, I want to make sure we, we have time for some of those sources to read it in the English. But you can already see this sounds so different reading it now than it did until Simchat Torah. Often we focus on the beauty of living in the house of the Lord. In other words, what I often focus on when I say this psalm is asking God to allow me to live somehow in God's presence. And yet suddenly now what I'm seeing around that is fear of evil, fear of war, of enemy. And um, it is not just about seeking um, the divine in the only in the uh, in the positive sense. He will shelter me in his pavilion on an evil day. Grant me the protection of his tent. Raise me high upon a rock. Now is my head high over my enemies roundabout. I sacrifice in his tent, in God's tent, with shouts of joy, singing and chanting a hymn to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Have mercy on me. Answer me. In your behalf, my heart says, seek my face. O Lord, I seek your face. Do not hide your voice from me. Do not thrust aside your servant in anger. You have ever been my help. Do not forsake me. Do not abandon me, O God, my deliverer. Though my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will take me in. Show me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my watchful foes. Do not subject me to the will of my foes, for false witnesses and unjust accusers have appeared against me. Had I not the assurance that I would enjoy the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, look to the Lord, be strong and of good courage, O look to the Lord. And so however we uh, gather our strength, our resilience, uh, whether it's in the togetherness of the community, when we pray together, when we learn together, when we do good deeds together, uh, let us look to that as our as as, as what will guide us and strengthen us, and will uh, cast over us protection, and will act as a protest to the evil that uh, we have unfortunately found ourselves uh, encompassed by in the last number of weeks. Let us go on and begin to learn some of the sources. Um, what I am going to be looking at in, uh, in, in the next 45 minutes are really sources that have to do with the creation of evil. The idea that human beings, that Adam, is created with both the potential for good and the potential for evil. And why is that something or how is that something that God allowed if we're created in the divine image? And one cannot help but reflect on those questions when we think about the evil that human beings have been doing to one another for thousands of years. And certainly the rabbis of the Talmudic period were well aware of the evil that the Roman, the Greeks and then the Romans imposed upon them, inflicted upon them as they were taken into exile. But let us pause before reflecting on history and reflecting on what we have experienced and let us learn a little Torah. And in the Torah portion, a little over a week ago, that we also read on Simchat Torah, in chapter one of Breshit, 
ויאמר אלוקים עשה אדם בצלמנו קדמותנו. And God said, let us make Adam humankind in our image after our likeness. And of course, this leads interpreters from the very early, earliest stage of interpretation to wonder who God is talking to. God speaks in the plural, let us make humans in our image after our likeness. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get into some of the rabbinic answers, but it is a question that continues to intrigue interpreters and commentaries from the earliest pre-rabbinic, right? Hundreds of years before the rabbis, we know that that question is already being asked until today, modern biblical scholarship. Who is the text referring to? And what does God say? They shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on the earth. So there will be an element of mastery, of ownership over the world that will be part and parcel of this creation. And now the next verse, equally interesting, Vayivra Elohim et adam b'tzalmo b'tzalem Elohim barauto. Zahar unikeva bara hota. And God created in the singular, humankind in the divine image. Created Adam in the image of God. Created Adam male and female. Not the time, but perhaps in the future, a class looking at how male and female were separated. That's Genesis 2, Bereshit Perak Beth. But what we see here is God creates in the singular, Adam in God's image both male and female. And then what does God bless them? God blesses and says, be fertile and increase, kru or vu, fill the earth, vikiv shuha. Now, the translator here, and it's an excellent translation, it's the JPS translation, no issues with the translation. But if you notice, the translator has chosen to use the word master. And yet, kivshua has within it kibush, conquer, occupy, rule, a word that came up a lot in the protests. I went, not the ones in Ephraim, but in Jerusalem, right? Die le kibush, enough with the occupation. And so the translator here has softened the word a little bit that man's mandate, Adam's mandate is to master the world, to rule over the world. But a master could potentially have a benevolence to uh, their mastership, to their lordship, right? Especially if the master has an interest in the good of what it is mastering. Kivshuha, kibush, is a much harsher word, a word of conquest, of conquering, of destruction potentially. And so I'm going to hold the word kivshuha as reflecting an incredible tension that already exists from the moment God creates Adam, that Adam is given enormous responsibility. Adam was created in the divine image singularly among all creatures, has an incredible, enormous responsibility, agency, ownership over the world that God has created, a partnership, if you will. But within that word, kifshuha, I see the potential, not just for responsible ownership, but destruction. What God says is at the end of Breshit, at the end of this section, God saw God saw all that had been made and found it very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day, right? So this is at the end, we, we then move into Shabbat. And so the rabbis already, and I'm going to share a particular midrash and, and give a little context, but God sees all this and finds it very good. First of all, right? Adam is very good. This is going to lead the rabbis to ask some interesting questions. In addition, what's missing from chapter one is what appears in chapter two that God takes Adam and places Adam in the Garden of Eden, to work and guard the Garden of Eden. God is the, God is the language of kibush v'kivshuha, master, own, conquer, however you want to translate it. 
And chapter two gives a different division of labor, a different responsibility. And I'm going to hold all three of them. Kivshua, Ovda, Shamra. To master, maybe conquer, maybe destroy. And then we're given Ovda, the Shamra, to work and to protect. Wait, wait, wait. The Kivshua has to be tempered. It has to be defined or encompassed by other language in order to let Adam know what it's really intended to be. Adam is at the top of the food chain, so to speak. Adam created in the image of God has this lethal power to unleash destruction. But if Adam is being attentive to God's command, God says, yes, you can do that. But really your mandate is the shamra. And so those three verbs, I think blend together to reflect the tension that we're going to already see in the rabbinic sources of that good and evil nestle within this creature developed in the image of God with the potential for an unbelievable untethered destruction and the ability to build the world to 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 prove or vu, to be fertile to multiply to fill the world with with goodness let's take a look at genesis raba um really for those who have studied with me i i love brashit raba genesis raba um it's a midrash that is written and around written and edited redacted in 450 ce in the land of israel hundreds of years after the destruction one of the things that's interesting when we think about a response to destruction, we have Eicha, we have Lamentations. And Lamentations is about the first temple, and then we make it about the second temple. And if you go through Tanaitic literature, there's not, this is not a scholar by the name of David Stern, uh, I, there's another scholar whose name I'm forgetting, have studied, when do the rabbis really begin to respond? to the terrible destruction, devastation, exile, the drastic change in what Judaism looks like in the aftermath of the Second Temple destruction. And what they largely conclude and prove is it's only in the fifth century CE that you begin to see a kind of written response as to what they've experienced. Now, how many hundreds of years have to go by? Now I will say post-Holocaust, it gets shortened drastically. But in the initial aftermath of the Holocaust, people were not talking about what happened to them. In fact, in many cases, it waited until the third generation where grandchildren began to ask their grandparents and children of survivors said, my parents never said a word. They never told me their story. It was only the grandchildren. We know the Eichmann trial also unlocked some stories. But what I'm suggesting is something similar, right? It takes longer. Everything takes longer in the old days. But it takes hundreds of years because the rabbis of the Tanaitic period post-destruction have to rebuild Judaism. They don't have time to begin wallowing or thinking or re-experiencing the trauma of the destruction. So it actually takes hundreds of years until they begin to wrestle with some of the questions of theodicy. Why did God do this? Were we accountable in some way? What happened to us? Let's look at the cruelty or the trauma. Why am I even saying this? I'm saying this because we're going into Genesis Rabbah, 450 CE, where they begin to really ask the questions of how did God create a human being that is so deeply flawed? How did God allow evil to exist in such a way in a being created in the image of God? And so Breshit Rabbah, which deals with Breshit, which deals with the creation of Adam, is going to ask those questions. And in the Mishnah, right, we're not really seeing those kind of philosophical, theological questions. They're interested in is, how do you keep Shabbos? When do you light the candles? What oils do you use to light candles? When do you say Shema, right? What is a lulav? They're asking practical questions about rich, applied ritual and practice. And those who have studied with me, we did an intro last year. We talked about that trajectory of interpretation. We're now several hundred years later in an interpretive process around the book of Breshit that's being written down. Rabbi Nachman Bar Shmuel Bar Nachman, so if you pay attention, right, 
this is the grandson of the original Nachman, father's name is Shmuel or Samuel, said in the name of Rav Samuel Bar Nachman. So I happen to love this because we're, we're in 450 CE, he probably lived about a hundred years earlier. We see continuity. We see a grandson who is named after his grandfather, who's gonna cite the Torah of his father. And there's something very comforting about that. In general, this entire chapter, chapter nine of Genesis Rabbah is going to be playing with tensions between opposites. Behold, it was very good. The text says, and behold, it was very good. And when I have an extra and, I can open up interpretation and, and broaden the discussion. That's legitimate in the world of rabbinic interpretation. An extra letter vav, which translates into and, becomes the platform for deeper immersion in the depth of the text. And so Rav Nachman says in the name of his father, behold, it was very good. This is the good inclination. It's kind of obvious. Behold, it was very good. It was good. And behold, it was very good. This is the Yetzir Hara, or the evil inclination, right? So already from the get-go, we have an idea. It plays out in this entire chapter, lots of different variations on this. I brought this one. I happen to like this passage. But behold, it was very good, tells me about the good. The and adds the contrast of evil. And behold, it was very good means that God created the human as good and evil and beheld that it was very good. There's something in that tension that was pre, predetermined, if you will, or was intentional in terms of creating Adam. Wait, says the Midrash, is the evil inclination then very good? And in the Hebrew, it's et maha. It's like, with incredible surprise, again, the translator has to choose how to translate, but et maha, like exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Seriously? Is it very good? How can you call the evil inclination that resides within a human very good? Well, this is really a rhetorical question. Rather, were it not for the evil inclination, a man would never build a house, would never marry a wife, would never beget children, and would never engage in commerce. And so what the Midrash suggests, I'm going to end, the Midrash ends with Shlomo, so let's let the Midrash end. This passage ends, remember, this is 9-7. There are six similar variations before and another three or four after, right? But this whole unit is going to end with Shlomo. Likewise, Solomon said, and I have considered all toil and all excelling in work, that it is each man's envy of his counterpart. That Solomon in Ecclesiastes, in Kohelet notes that envy, which is not a very nice quality to admit to, one might even say it has the evil inclination within it because we know envy can lead to, can lead to murder in the case of Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel. We know envy can lead us astray, but Solomon notes, yes, but envy also gets my butt in gear. It also gets me out of my chair. It pushes me to excel so that I can one-up my neighbor, if you will, or my brother, right? So the idea of the tension of good and evil motivating us, pushing us, driving us, driving us to succeed, because if all we had were goodness and sweetness and no tension of something that we needed to overcome in our lives, nothing would get accomplished. And again, it's a very interesting observation of why the evil inclination plays a necessary role in human existence. I often use this passage because the Yetzir Hara often refers to sexual, uh, sexual attraction um, and that they call it Yetzir Hara is very interesting, the evil inclination. And I often quote a sex therapist, I, I listened to a lecture he gave, where he said, sexuality is the reason that drives people to go and meet one another. That sexual tension, the energy, and ultimately the choosing, right? This is my mate, this is the person I wanna be with. That that tension, which can be used for such evil, such perverseness, can also be used to create a framework for partnership and for family. And so it's a very similar, uh, similar idea. Okay. 
What I want to look at next is um, we're going to look really at, at maybe three midrashim. We don't have time to look at more. And God said, Na'asada. So the Mitrash asks what we were interested in. Let us make Adam. Well, with who did God take counsel? Rabbi Joshua ben Levi said, God took counsel with the works of heaven and earth, like a king who had two advisors without whose knowledge he did nothing whatsoever. Now, I find that very, uh, very interesting and almost poignant. God consults with heaven and earth. Rabbi Joshua ben Levi certainly knows that Reshit starts with Shamayim Ba'aretz, with the splitting of heaven and earth, and Devarim, or Deuteronomy, ends with Moses calling to heaven and earth to be Moses' witnesses, the covenant between God and the children of Israel. Okay, so heaven and earth as advisors to God already is kind of embedded in the opening and closing of the five books of Torah, and this idea that God consults. Of course, God has created heaven and earth, but somehow they are paramount. They are first in the order of creation, and that's who God consults with. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman said, God took counsel with the works of each day, like a king who had an associate without whose knowledge he did nothing. Now, of course, in both of these scenarios, the king is the king. Associates and advisors are nice. That's why God consults, but then God in singular, Vayivra Elohim, God consult, God creates in the singular. I pointed that out when we saw the text. First there was plural, then it went to the singular. God created in the singular. So we have this idea that God consults and God consults with other aspects of God's self, if you will. Other aspects of God that have been created into heaven and earth or into the works of each day. I will say that given what we are rapidly destroying the world, uh, not just because of evil, but because of uh, global warming and all of the impact, right? The enormous impact human beings have had on the globe. I find it very poignant that in 450 CE, while Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman is even earlier, 200 CE, there's an awareness that God consults with the other six days of the week pre-Adam, because Adam is going to have enormous impact, an enormous footprint on the rest of the world. And so, so maybe God should consult with the world that Adam is going to imprint on, that Adam is going to have impact on, either for good or for bad. And certainly I think there, there is what to think about in terms of uh, our responsibility collectively around the world and our impact on, on the world we live in. And we know um, that, that we've had impact. Ravani said he took counsel with his own heart. Now we're going in a totally different direction. That God takes counsel within God's heart. And of course, the heart is meant to be the seat of wisdom, but, and also the seat of emotion, right? So the heart is representing something that is in contrast to the seichel, to the rational part of God. Right? So God consults within God's heart. It may be compared to a king who had a palace built by an architect, but when he God saw it, uh, when the king saw it did not please him, with whom is he to be indignant, surely with the architect? The irony of what you should be paying attention to, the Yitatsev Alibo, and it grieved God at God's heart. God's the architect, right? So the king and the architect in this metaphor are the same in this allegory, really, are the same. Right, because God creates Adam or consults from within God's self, within God's heart, and then when God is grieved, God is essentially grieved with God because that's who created. Right. So what we see here is um, God's desire leads God to go inward to a part of God that is almost irrational. Right. His lave, which in the ancient world would have been the seat of wisdom, but I believe here is also meant to reflect regish or emotion. I don't think there's any other way to uh, understand it. And, uh, and, and that God becomes saddened or grieved within God's heart because that's what encouraged God to create Adam. And that will really be uh, an, an intro or prologue to what I think comes up in the next Midrash and will illuminate it even further. Where Rebrachia said, when the Holy One, blessed be he, be he, came to create Adam, God saw righteous and wicked. 
arising from Adam. Said God, if I create Adam, wicked people will spring from Adam. If I do not create Adam, how are the righteous to spring from Adam? And what I see here, again, it's an imaginary, obviously fictitious dialogue that Rabbi Bragia has created. But throughout Breshi Rabbah, they often go into God's head, into God's mind. And they try to figure out or tease out how God came to do what God did. And they come up with all sorts of dialogues and scenarios. It's as if they use God's voice to voice the questions that they're having that are most basic with regard to, to theology, to theodicy in this case. And what Rabbi Brachia says is God had to confront the reality of what Adam was going to bring into the world, that by creating Adam with kifshuha of da shamra, with the capability for, for conquering, mastering, for working, for guarding, yetzer hara, yetzer hatov, the good and the bad, the ability to make choice, right? The free will, which is being alluded to here, but not directly addressed. God creates Adam to be able to make choices. But as a result, God sees full well that Adam is going to produce righteous and wicked. And what does God say? If I create Adam, there will be wickedness. There will be evil people born into this world. But if I do not create Adam, how can there be righteousness? How can there be goodness? How can there be compassion? How can there be kindness? How could be, there be the infinite and myriad ways in which we do good in this world? And God is holding both of those on a scale, evil, righteous, evil, righteous. What then did the Lord do? God removed the way of the wicked out of God's sight and associated the quality of mercy with God and created Adam. As it is written, we'll see the wordplay. The wordplay is amazing. For the Lord regards the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked, tovad. Tovad really means to perish, and they do a wordplay. We're going to say, uh, he destroyed it, ibda, from before God's sight, and associated the quality of mercy with God's self and created Adam. Okay, and now I'm going to go back and unpack this a little more uh, uh, intentionally. What does God have to do? God has to do what I would say uh, as someone who does not, I practice mindfulness, not nearly enough. But one of the things that happens if you've practiced mindfulness or any sort of meditation is the instructor, whatever it is, on, you know, I have an app, or if you're on live or on a YouTube or whatever, will often say to you, oh, you see thoughts coming up, that's okay, gently push them to the side, right? If we look at the Hebrew, it's even more apparent. It says, God, um, he fleeg is to float. Right, he floats the thoughts of the wicked from away from God's face. Right, that I did just push the thoughts to the side. Right, so God has to, when confronting the reality of what Adam is going to do, has to shove to the side, maybe a little more forcefully than the instructor often tells us. Be kind, don't judge, and move it to the side. God does it a little more forcefully, but God pushes to the side the way of the wicked. But the reality is, and we all know this because in mindfulness as well, they tell you those thoughts aren't going to go away. Don't try to erase thoughts because that creates tension. You know, you, you acknowledge them, you look at them, you push them to the side, they're still there, you breathe through them. So God is doing all that with the wicked, but God is not going to be able to create Adam with those thoughts pushed to the side. So God harnesses mercy because rachamim, mercy as opposed to deen, justice, allows for more softness and allows God to like, not just push to the side, but to create from within God's heart, if you will, right? Something that really shouldn't be created if we're being rational, if we're being just, if we're looking at the cold, hard truth of what's gonna come out. And what happens in the wordplay in Tehillim is it says the ways of the wicked will be destroyed. They say, no, no, no. we're going to do a wordplay here. It's not that they perish, that God destroys it, ibda, from before God's self. God's like, don't want to see that, moving it to the side, not in my view, right? All I can see now are the righteous and mercy, and that's enough. And now God creates Adam. Again, it's it's marvelous. Because Rabbi Brachia is essentially saying, how did God do this? 
And the answer is God wanted the righteous. And in order to get righteous, God had to suffer the wicked, right? Or we all have to suffer the wicked, to be honest. Okay, what does Rabbi Hanina say? Rabbi Hanina says something. It's almost, there's a little bit of humor here. God, uh, Rabbi Hanina said, when God came to create Adam, he took counsel with the ministering angels, right? The ministering angels who are just reflections of God and who are very static in that sense. There's no growth there. Saying to them, let us make man. What shall his character be? Asked they. They're not so quick to say yes. Righteous people shall spring from Adam, God answered. As it is written, and now we have the same wordplay, for the Lord knows the ways of the righteous, right? He, God only made known, Hodia, the way of the righteous to the ministering angels. And God hid, Ibda, same wordplay, the ways of the wicked, right? So even in his consulting, he is not fully transparent in this scenario. God hides from God's self. God hides from the ministering angels, the wickedness that will emerge from Adam, because if we go back to the opening line where Brachia recognizes without Adam, there will be no righteousness in the world. Again, the ministering angels will do whatever the ministering angels do, and the and the moon and stars and the sky and the world will maybe be a fresher, healthier place, but there will be no direct interaction with God through a creature that has the ability to reflect the divine into the world. And so what does God have to do here? God destroys the way, and, and notice this last line, the quality of justice would never have permitted Adam to be created, right? That's why God had a partner with mercy in Rabbi Brachia's scenario. And Rabbi Hanina says, God had actually lied to the angels because if God had told the ministering angels the truth, the virtue of justice would have showed up and said, absolutely not, right? So in both of these, we have God not being fully honest about what this creature, Adam, is going to mean. And that is why we're going to have wickedness and righteousness side by side in this creep. God knew, but God wants the righteous. Okay, let's take a look at the next source. It's even uh, clearer there. Rabbi Simon says, Rabbi Shimon says, Simon said, when the Holy One, blessed be he, came to create Adam, the ministering angels formed themselves into groups and parties, some of them saying, let Adam not be created, while others argued, let Adam be created, right? It sounds a little bit like the judicial reform in priests and Torah, judicial reform, no judicial reform, right? You have parties and groups, and there's serious fighting going on in the heavens. It's very mythological. This particular midrash definitely has echoes of mythology here, right? There's all this fighting going on. Thus it is written, and now we're going to have four virtues coming together to fight it out, right? Really, the ministering angels as virtues. Love and truth is really chesed and truth. It really should be righteous deeds uh, fought together. Righteousness and peace. The Hebrew is chesed ve'emet, sedek and shalom, right? So again, the translator here, in my opinion, did not do the best job. It's not really love. Um, it's acts of chesed, of goodness versus truth. And then you have tzedek, which are acts of justice, which include charity, right? Tzedek as in not the cold, hard world of, of law, but justice as in social justice, as again, acts of justice versus peace. Okay, we have this fight going on in the heavens between two sets of virtues who are really fighting it out. Chesed said, let Adam be created because Adam will dispense acts of kindness, of goodness in the world. And without Adam, such kindness and goodness and righteousness will not exist. And truth said, let Adam not be created because Adam is compounded falsehood. Adam is the antithesis of truth. Tzedek said, let Adam be created because Adam will perform acts of tzedek, right? However, we would teach all that, right? Acts of, of justice. Peace said, let Adam not be created because Adam is full of strife. Okay, and so we're at a, what we call in Hebrew, a teku. There's no way to resolve this. They're, they're all right, right? The virtues that are arguing for Adam are absolutely correct. Adam can bring something into the world that will not exist without Adam in terms of righteousness and goodness and, and the, a kind of justice for the weak and the oppressed. And of course, Adam can cause there to be weak and oppressed right? Adam is the antithesis of truth. Adam is uh, full of strife, uh, full of war. What did the Lord do? God took truth and cast it to the ground, definitely reminiscent of Zeus with the thunderbolt, right? Throwing it to the ground. 
said the ministering angels before the Holy One, blessed be he, sovereign of the universe. Hold on one second. Sovereign. Sovereign of the universe, why do you despise your seal, your truth? You let truth arise from the earth. Hence it is written, let truth spring up from the earth. Okay, and there, there are different ways of understanding why God removes truth. I think it fits well with what we saw previously. God had to hide what God was doing from justice, from Dean, from, from, the, from the cold uh, quality of Dean, of, of justice, capital J. Here too, the idea of truth will get in the way of God being able to, to, to uh, create Adam. In addition, he now has a two to one majority in favor, chesed and tzedek versus shalom, right? He had to get rid of one of them. And I'd like to suggest that I think God casts truth to the earth so that we humans have any possibility of reaching some sort of emet of truth. God understood that that was gonna be the biggest struggle, right? So he casts tr truth to the earth so that we have more access to truth from the ground up. But those are all interpretations of this interpretation. Moving on, Rabbi Huna, the elder of Safari said, while the ministering angels were arguing with each other and disputing with each other, the Holy One, blessed be he, created Adam, said God to them, what can you avail? Adam has already been made, right? And so that's where we go from the plural to the singular, where this Midrash says all of the quarreling and quabbling and squabbling and arguing and positions here and there, at the end of the day, God is God. God created, right? You made good points both sides, but I created Adam, right? And so you get to a point where you you can, there's no longer discussion. There's no longer a way to fully understand why God did what God did, but clearly God desired this creature filled with the tension of good and evil, filled with truth and or falsehood and strife and chesed, and sedek, right? All of those virtues, all of those qualities are going to define human existence and something in that complex synthesis of what the human being is as reflection of the divine is very, very attractive to God, is, is desired, right? God is in search of that. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip down. I wanna get to the last um, few sources. I'll just say one more uh, point that the that the Midrash makes. This is all in the same chapter of Genesis Rabbah. Adam is created with four attributes of the higher beings, four attributes of the lower beings, right? The attributes of the higher beings are Adam stands upright like the ministering angels. Adam speaks, Adam understands, Adam sees. And we're like the lower beings, meaning like the animals in that we eat and drink, we procreate, we excrete, we die. Right. And so um, that synthesis, that synergy, really, between upper and lower, between heaven and earth, between the physical and the spiritual are also very much reflective of the uniqueness of this uh, creature, this creation called Adam. I'm going to before I look at two more modern sources, one is Rev Cook and one is uh, and Jonathan, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and that's where we'll close. This Mishnah in Tractate Avot, I think really speaks to that synthesis between heaven and earth, between the physical and the spiritual that is found in every human being who is created in the image of God. This is said at funerals, at Jewish funerals. Unfortunately, it's being said over and over and over uh, again. Akavya ben Mahalal said, reflect on three things and you will not come within the power of sin. Know from whence you have come and whither you are going and before whom you are destined to account and reckoning. And I, I truly believe, and when I teach this Mishnah, I believe if we would just take that line and put it before us every day, right? To think about, wait a minute, where have we come from? Where are you going? Before, for whom are you destined to give account and reckoning? In other words, the meaning of your life from the moment you're born is going to be defined by the span of your life of which you have no idea for the most part, how long that's going to be. And the idea that when you get up every day and you think about the choices, I don't believe a caveat thinks any of us can be saints, can be perfect, unflawed human beings. There is no such thing. We will all make mistakes. We are all flawed. We will all transgress. But if you intentionally are thoughtful about where you have come from and where you are going and who you are destined to give an account to, however you want to define that, your children, your spouse, 
the legacy you're leaving behind, God, the divine, the community, the world at large. But your legacy begins with the choices you begin to make when you become a conscious, intentional human being at whatever age that is. And a Kavya Ben Malala, and we say this right at death, and it's meant to both, in my opinion, sober us and also inspire us. Because every day when we get up, we can ask that question of ourselves. And we can intentionally make choices or try to correct wrongs knowing that we're finite, right? We represent heaven and earth, spiritual, physical, but we will die like the physical. And as a result, there's a finite nature that is meant to remind us on a regular basis that we need to think about what we're leaving when we go. What is the meaning that our life has? And we as humans have the ability to ask that. Animals are not asking how meaningful can my life be today? Where have you come from? A putrefying drop. It's talking about semen. Where are you going to? A place of dust, worms, and maggots, right? A caveat doesn't mince words. He says, let's be honest, right? There's a very physical nature to both the beginning of life and the end of life. But who do you, every human being, get to give a reckoning before? Melech malchem lapima kadosh baruchu. And I think that's a resounding note, a high note. You humans have the ability to give accounting to Melech Machem Machem Kadosh Baruch Hu, in a way that the, the grass and the, and the trees and the animals don't. So yes, you're right. There's a strong physical component to your life that's going to guide you and distract you and limit you. And you have the potential to stand before Melech Machem Machem Kadosh Baruch Hu. Hold both of those as you think about from where you have come and where you are going. I want to now bring, um, I'm going to, I'm going to bring Rav Sachs because I want to end with Rav Cook. The greatest challenge to faith is, if God exists, how is it that evil exists? Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, in most religions, that is a challenge to faith. In Judaism, it's exactly the opposite, because it is the people with the greatest faith who ask this question most powerfully and most passionately. Abraham says, shall the judge of all earth not do justice? Moses says, why have you done evil, God, to these people? Jeremiah says, God, I know you always win when we have an argument about justice, but tell me, why do the wicked prosper? The entire book of Job is dedicated to this question. So why is it then that in every other religion, evil is a threat to faith? Whereas in Judaism, the question of evil is in the very heart of faith. And that led to my definition of faith as protest. God created a world, a physical world, that obeys physical laws. And because it obeys physical laws, there are such things as earthquakes and tsunamis and natural catastrophes. You couldn't have a natural universe without these disasters happening. It was only because matter coalesced and formed stars and those stars eventually exploded, spreading stardust throughout the world, that they ever coalesced to become planets, one of which was Earth, on, which, on one of which life began. Without these natural disasters, there couldn't be a physical universe. Secondly, without giving space for human beings to commit acts of evil, we wouldn't have freedom and therefore we couldn't do even good, right? That was my midrash where God sees the wicked and the righteous and recognizes without wickedness, there won't be righteousness. And therefore God turns to human beings and says, look, I gave you freedom. I gave you a physical world. In such a world, bad things are gonna happen. I cannot solve those bad things on my own because I gave you freedom and I gave you responsibility. And now let us confront evil together. So in Judaism, the problem of evil is the simple statement of the human condition that the world that is not the world, that the world that is, is not the world that ought to be. And in that cognitive dissonance, faith is born. Not faith as accepting that that's the way the world is, faith as a protest. And the answer to why does evil exist is not a philosophical answer, it's an action. If I do one good deed, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, writing an injustice anywhere in the world, I make the world that's a little closer to the world that ought to be. And that is why the existence of evil and protest against that evil and the human responsibility that God has charged us with to fight that evil is not the grit in the machine that wrecks faith. In Judaism, it is the machine that drives faith. We stand up and protest against evil by creating just societies, compassionate communities, and loving human relationships. Judaism is God's call to our responsibility. And I want to end with Rev Cook because... I find this to be really what I want to end with. This is what I want to leave us with. The pure righteous, the tzadikim that God sought to create. 
do not complain of the dark, but they increase the light. They do not complain of evil, but increase tzedek. Again, I'm, tzedek, I think, is broader than just justice. They do not complain of heresy. They increase faith. They do not complain of ignorance, but increase wisdom. And, um, and I want to end with that, that idea of um, the protest against evil is adding goodness. The protest against darkness is adding light. We can get sucked into the questions about darkness and evil. And, and there, there may be moments where we allow that to, to suck us in and we acknowledge those thoughts, but ultimately, as God did, push in the Midrash, push them to the side and allow front and center to be um, the goodness and the light that human beings are able to bring into the world. And, and that is what's bringing me, I started with these articles that, you know, the Jerusalem Post was filled with them this weekend and Haaretz uh, uh, filled with articles of the goodness that is coming out from people from all walks of Israel, the socio Bedouins and Haredim and secular and 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 rich and poor alike in in their their giving capacity uh, and in their sense of achdut and uh, and I think that is the message that um, do not get sucked into the darkness increase the light thank you Achama thank you um, uh, we as uh, Rabbi Spratt mentioned we're really grateful to have you to be with us and through the magic of this technology for us to be able to learn together. Um, there will be more opportunities to learn uh, with Nahama and to be in conversation with with one another. And uh, we will we will have uh, updates this week on the next steps for our our uh, fall parties program. Uh, for those of you that already registered for that, but also for the entire congregation to be able to participate as we um, find meaningful ways to uh, uh, to learn together amidst everything that's going on um, in Israel. So thank you. Um, wishing everybody a good uh, rest of your weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It gave me a lot of strength to be learning with you to see your faces, to uh, learn Torah, and I hope we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.